when John in his gospel gets wordy and mystical like that, I and you and you and me and they one with us and I'm one with you, it, it can get a little hard to follow. But essentially, Jesus here is talking about absence, withdrawal, distance. And certainly, no matter how confusing we might find John's mystical language, distance from God is something we can all relate to. Of course, this is the earthly Jesus speaking before the crucifixion, which is different from the resurrected Jesus we hear in the book of Acts. But even here before the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus speaks of the disciples in terms that are so positive, so affirming as to be aspirational, as if, as if he's saying to them, because he knows that the disciples are eavesdropping on this prayer. It's addressed to God, but he knows they're listening. And by the way, he's saying to us, because John, the author, knows that we're out here eavesdropping on the whole scene. Jesus seems to be saying, this is who I know you to be, even though you don't always show it forth. He prays to the Father, the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know them, and, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. This is a full-throated endorsement of the disciples' firm faith. But that is not always how Jesus talks about the disciples. Just a few paragraphs back, previous chapter, chapter 16, he challenges them on this very point when they claim to believe that he came from God and Jesus answered them, oh, do you now believe? Do you? The hour is now coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each one to his home and you will leave me alone. He calls them out ahead of time on the fact that they will abandon him. And sure enough, they abandon him. They scatter before and during the crucifixion. But then right here, right after that, in chapter 17, the part we just heard, Jesus affirms their faith as if he's looking forward with a clear view of the disciples that they will be called to be after the resurrection. It's aspirational. So now in the book of Acts, Jesus has come back. We just had a conversation with the earthly Jesus, and now we're having a conversation with the resurrected Jesus. And now the question is, will he abandon them? The reading from Acts opens with the apostles asking the risen Jesus, who has now appeared to them, is this the time? Is this now the time after all we've been through for the consummation of all the things we've been praying for and looking forward to. Now, they have been through a long journey, an odyssey, really, with Jesus. From all the way back, leaving boats and nets behind, leaving the tax collector's booth behind to follow an unknown prophet, not a famous person. And through all the teaching and preaching and healing in Galilee, all the all the notice, all the hubbub, all the controversy, all the way to Jerusalem where now, post-resurrection, now they have lived through the brutal public execution of Jesus, the apparent destruction of this whole movement by the Romans. And now, as promised, although they didn't always understand or believe the promise, but now, as promised, the resurrected Jesus is among them. Is this the time? It's been a long trip. All they're asking is, are we there yet? They're thinking we must have been wrong. We must have been wrong when Jesus was crucified. It's not actually over. And yet, and yet they are still emphatically wrong about what the there of the are we there yet is going to look like. Is this the time, they ask? Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? As if 
they're, they're still looking forward to the same consummation that they expected in Jesus' earthly life, that he would overthrow the empire, restore the independent political Israel. Maybe the resurrection was the demonstration of power that merely precedes the dramatic overthrow of the empire. Maybe this is like resurrection is something like a show of nuclear force. It will intimidate the Romans into submission. But not only is the empire not cowed by the resurrection, the empire doesn't notice or care. It doesn't even see any resurrection. It goes marching right on ahead. And then, in that moment when the disciples are saying, maybe now, maybe now, maybe this is the time, this resurrected Jesus, rather than take up this military political cause that they've been looking for him to lead in his earthly life, he just floats away on a cloud into heaven. Thanks, that's helpful. He disappears. This is a crystallization of what makes resurrection faith a hard faith. Because resurrection, resurrection faith asks us to believe and proclaim week after week and year after year and century after century that the empires of brutality that apparently run the world, what St. Paul calls the powers and principalities, have in fact been thoroughly undermined, have in fact had their authority exposed as a lie, and asks us to celebrate that fact even though the powers and principalities don't notice or care. So there we are with the disciples wanting to know the time. Are we there yet? So here's what a, a sort of standard, uh, down the middle, traditional uh, commentary on this passage from the book of Acts would tell you about the, about the ascension. By emphasizing the manner rather than the time of Jesus' return, emphasizing the manner rather than the time, because the, the two angels, the men in white, they say he will come again the way you see him going. By emphasizing the manner rather than the time, Luke redirects the church's attention away from end time speculation. So Luke, the author, is sort of batting away the disciples' question. Our question, when? Is it time now? When are all these promises? When will this all be consummated? When will it all become real? Luke, we know, if we've been reading carefully, we already know that Luke is messing with time. Because he tells this ascension story twice. It's the, the hinge, you know, for Luke, who wrote these two books, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, the, and the hinge between, you know, book one and book two is the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. He tells the ascension twice. At the very end of the Gospel of Luke, you read these resurrection appearances and then it appears that it all happened basically in a day. And Jesus is carried off into heaven. And they witness it. But then at the beginning of the second book, the beginning of the book of Acts, which we just heard, we find him saying that Jesus appeared to them in many ways over 40 days. So he's already kind of squirreling around with time. Luke redirects the church's attention away from end time speculation. He bats away the question, let me put that on my calendar. So a few years ago, I got a call from a member of my extended family who was delighted. She was thrilled. She was over the moon because her daughter's longtime boyfriend had proposed and now they were engaged. It was summertime when I got that call. And so I, I don't, I don't always do, you know, like gushing enthusiasm is not always my strongest suit, but I was trying to, <laughs> I was, I was trying to do my best. She was really excited. So I was like, oh, that's wonderful. We, by the way, we knew, we'd known for years, these two people were getting married. So, oh, that's so wonderful. So glad to hear it. When is the wedding? 
This was summer. And she said, it's going to be two years from November. <laughs> at which point, my effort at enthusiasm gave way. And I'm sorry to tell you that I then said to the mother of the bride, you do realize there are people who will be divorced before then who haven't even met yet. I was focused on the when. When will this thing happen? Give me the date when the thing will be accomplished. And I had overlooked, because in my, I was telling them, I was thinking, well, what's changing here? These people have been living together for years. We know they're going to get married eventually. And now they're still living together and they're still going to get married eventually. What's, the, what's changed? I was overlooking the ways in which the miraculous blessing of that relationship was already growing, was already being revealed in that couple's life and would continue, God willing, way past the wedding. I wanted to know the date. The wedding itself was the, the glorification, the revelation of something that was already true. God doesn't love us better or differently before or after the resurrection. In John, one of the things that trips us up, well, I should say me, one of the things that trips me up in the Gospel of John is all this business about glorify, glorification. What does it mean to be in the glory of the Father? What does it mean when Jesus prays in the Gospel of John, glorify me? But one way, one way to interpret that glorification is as revelation, the, the truth that is revealed. And the marriage of heaven and earth that we know in the coming of God in Christ is revealed again and again and again and not on a particular date. The marriage of heaven and earth in every act of love, in every defiance of the authority of the powers and principalities, in the church made one with Christ in the bread and wine of the Eucharist, in every newborn child of God, which by the way is how Christ first came in the Gospel of Luke, revealed in every human being made in the image of God, whether that person knows Christ's presence or finds the very idea absurd. In all of those places is the revelation, the glorification, breaking through the absence and the distance, we find the startling presence of God in Christ. All of mine are yours. I have been glorified in them, in every human life. So, these two witnesses in, robe, in white robes. Remember, they're, they're, they're like the ones who showed up at the tomb. And Luke seems to be, Luke seems to be acknowledging the, the, the ancient Hebrew tradition that if you have two witnesses, you have some authority. So these two men in dazzling robes show up and they say, He will come again in the way that you saw him go. He will come again in the way that you saw him go. And I think the challenge for us in this dynamic of absence and presence and the paradox between the two is to try to notice when we, when we are aware of that sense of the distance of God, when we have experienced the withdrawal of God from our lives or from the front of our consciousness, when we have experienced the howling absence of God. To meditate, to pray on, he will come again in the way that you saw him go. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, instead of turn away from that place and try to get to somewhere else, to look into that experience, to challenge yourself to, to face it. 
in faith that maybe that's the place where Christ will come in the way that you saw him go. So let us pray for the strength and the patience and the faith to be those disciples that Jesus describes aspirationally in his earthly life and to be those apostles that the angels call us to be watching, to look into the absence, to look into the withdrawal, to look into what sometimes feels like the yawning gap between heaven and earth. For as often and as long as it takes to see the glory of Christ, the revelation of Christ's presence coming again in the way that you saw him go. Amen.